Good morning. I hope everybody's having a good day today. It's just a good day to be here one more time. It's a lot of people when we closed our eyes last night weren't able to open their eyes this morning. So for that, we got to say thank you. Yes, Father God. To just be here one more time. We don't know what tomorrow may bring. We don't know what the future holds. But we know today we're thankful to be here. Yes. Now me being, me being a member of, well, a visitor here, I have to bring my honor and gratitude and greetings coming from Mount Pisgah Baptist Church where Reverend Henry McGill Jr. is my pastor. And it is an honor because Miss Georgette has She's asked me this for months, and every week I see her, she was like, you got your stuff ready. You better be ready now. So I'm, I'm thankful that, that St. John thought of me and are allowing me to come speak the word of God to you today. So if you will please bow your heads with me in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to say thank you. Father God, we've had some hard times in our life, Father God, but you are always there. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. Father God, we've done wrong in our lives, Father God, and sometimes we don't even deserve your blessings, but your grace and your mercy still reigns upon us, and for that we have to say thank you, Lord. Father God, sometimes these roads ahead of us look dark. Father God, these roads ahead of us look hard and difficult, Father God, but we know that you are always with us, Father God, and we say thank you, Lord. We ask for a blessing today in this word, Father God. Let the word today touch somebody's spirit, Father God, and change them for the better. Father God, through this, we ask to continue to keep our little hands in your big, magnificent hands, Father God, and continue to pick us up when we fall short of your grace. In your precious Son, Jesus' name, and in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, we say amen. amen. Now, today, I want to touch on asking a serious question that I feel as though we kind of think we already know, and it's, where is your faith? And I'm pinpointing that by saying, trusting God and trusting your power. Someone tell your neighbor, trusting God, trusting your power. So, a show of hands, who in here believes in miracles? As children of God, of course, everyone should raise their hand for that. Now, a better question is, who in here believes that you have the capability to conduct mir miracles by your hands. See, the hands got a lot smaller because the obvious answer is that we can't do miracles because there's only one that can do such great things. So if you allow me over this next short period of time to bust that bubble and enrich your spirit, because do you know that in the Bible, and I'm gonna just use a small miracle, that Jesus was not the only one to walk on water. I never knew that. When I read that, that shocked me. And if you will look with me as we'll go into the book in the New Testament and the book of Matthews, the 14th chapter. And when you have it, please say amen. Once again, it is the book of Matthews, the 14th chapter, verses 26 through 32. And I'll begin, and it reads... And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is the Spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore thou did, didst thou doubt? Let me read that again. O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come unto the ship, the wind ceased. Now, Jesus could have easily just walked on the boat, and this would have been just a regular part of scripture in the book. But there was a purpose behind this event. And who was Peter? Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And that's probably why he spoke so boldly when he wanted proof to see that this being in the water truly was Christ. 
And Jesus proved it to him by allowing Peter to come to him on the water. By Peter's faith, was he able to perform a miracle by walking on the water? So who is this Peter? I mean, Peter was a man born of flesh just like you and I. Yet here he is in the book of Matthew doing what most of us have been taught as a small miracle performed only by Jesus. So why did Peter begin to sink? Here he is in the physical presence of Jesus Christ, his and all of our Lord and Savior. So what could have led him to lose this miraculous power? In the text, it says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. Peter allowed himself to become afraid. Peter was wielding a great power just by walking on the water. But as his fear of his surroundings grew, his power went away. He lost his power because he gave in to fear. How many of us know that fear will cause you to lose any power that the Lord gives you? Why? Because Paul told us in the book of Timothy, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So when you fear, you're doubting. And when you're doubting, you're not trusting. If you believe that you can't do it, you're telling God, I don't believe that you can get me through it anymore. So what is fear? One definition states that fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. Another defines fear as to expect or worry about something bad or unpleasant. Peter lost his faith in the in the power he was given because he chose to instead believe in the storm around him. He stopped believing in Christ in front of him and worried about the problem around him. And because of this, he expected to sink. And so he did. And like Peter, we all tend to focus on how big our obstacles are and not focusing on how big our God is. Just a little test. If you have your program with you, I want you to do something for me real quick. Hold your program in front of your face and try to look at me. Now, you can't see me. Now, does that make this program bigger than me? No, it doesn't. But because we focus, we put the paper so close to us, we made that bigger than what's in front of us. And that's what we do to God. God holds the whole world in his hands, all of us. And if you look at the world as they show it on the Internet and anywhere, you can't see us on the world. That shows how big this world is compared to all of us. It shows how big God is just because he can hold it in his hands. But we hold all these problems, all these troubles. We make them big because we focus on them more than we focus on God. You must learn to start believing in yourselves. Now, let me break that down because I'm not saying that you hold all power. But when God gives you power, you must believe in that power that he has given you. Peter's faith was what drove him to walk on the water. But his fear of what he would be able that he wouldn't be able to weather the storm was what made him sink. As Christians, we sometimes forget the fact that God is with us and Christ is within us. And this is all in the word. In the book of Psalm, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. And in the book of John, Christ himself says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Someone tell your neighbor to trust God. Trust your power. So why do we do that? Our minds have been formulated to believe that God can do all these miraculous things except anoint us with power to do miraculous things. We love to just, child, I'm waiting on the Lord. Lord Jesus, I'm waiting on you. When there are some things that Christ has given us power to accomplish. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking to the people who can live up to saying, now that I've done all I can, just stand. I'm talking about the people who are at home saying, Lord, I'm praying for a car, but aren't looking for a job. (laughs) 
So once again, let me be clear. I'm not trying to tell anyone that you hold any ability on your own. I'm saying that Christ gives you power to do amazing things if you're in his will. To sum it all up, I made this phrase up. We become spoiled believers. You know how God opens doors for your lives? Well, what we fall short to realize is that many times these doors are wide open. But we're so blind to unlocking that God-given power that we're just sitting down waiting for God to pick us up to take us through that door. And this could be, just like Peter, we began, we've begun to see our winds become boisterous. We begin to see our troubles that block us from this path. And because of this fear, it stops us from reaching to what God has waiting for us. Your money, your car, your health, your love, these doors can be wide open in, in front of us. But yet we'll still sit there because we don't have enough faith to continue your walk towards Christ. An example of this is also found in Matthew. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood for 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned about, turned him about. And when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Now I want you to just think about that. This lady was diseased for 12 years. And in that part of the Bible, Jesus was in route to go somewhere else. He was going to bring somebody back from the dead. This miracle Jesus was going to do had nothing to do with this lady. The lady's importance here was showing how her faith gave her the power to reach God. And where she had been suffering for 12 years, by her weathering those storms, by her continuing through those boisterous winds and continuing on that path to Christ, she was made whole. Someone tell your neighbor to trust God, trust your power. So why don't we believe in ourselves? For some reason, when people start talking about the miracles that we are capable of, we stop taking the Bible literally. Literally, we stop taking the Bible literally. We believe that God is the creator of the world. We believe that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he died and rose from the dead. But if anyone starts talking about miracles that God has intended for us to do, then we start trying to downplay God. You know, in the Bible, he doesn't mean it that way. You know, he, that was kind of a figure of speech. Right? Now, I know there are parables that Jesus talked about, but when it's talking about miracles for us to do, you know, he, he didn't mean it that way. He didn't, he didn't really mean it that way. Not realizing that when we start downplaying God, we're showing our lack of faith. That's what fear is. Fear is a lack of faith, a lack of belief, a lack of trust. A lot of things we've been able, we've been afraid of is because it doesn't agree with what we've been taught all our lives. We shouldn't be able to walk on water because we've been taught gravity. When we find out that the odds of us being able to live out a certain dream are a million to none, that means it's virtually impossible. It's hard. It'll be impossible for someone to marry and to become the next Donald Trump. Why? Because the numbers are stacked against us. And when we give life to that doubt, we bring death to faith. I'm going to say that again. When we give life to doubt, we bring death to faith. You have to hold strong to your faith because nothing is impossible to God. Nothing is impossible to God. And by Christ being of God and Christ being in us, we have the power to do impossible things if we have faith. The word of Christ in the book of Matthew says, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed. Do y'all know how small that is? If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence from yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible to you. Now, I've heard this scripture all my life, but people always forget to, to say that last part. And nothing shall be impossible to you. I was talking with my mentor 
one time about faith. And he, and he spoke off of this part in, this, um, in the Bible. And he said, you notice how there's no mountains moving. Maybe that's not because it's impossible, but because we don't believe enough. It is shown by his word that Christ has belief in us as being his children. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, take hold of your power. We sing about it all the time. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the lamb. Now that's an old song, so I know not many people know that song. So a newer song, there is power in the name of Jesus. Now I know I can't sing, I'm just trying to show an example. But we talk about power all the time, but we don't utilize it. Don't be afraid of what the storms may bring. Because God is with us, and God and Christ are in us. Tell your neighbor to trust God. Trust your power. I was reading an excerpt on the internet, and this is a good example, and I expanded on it. And I want to leave you with this. In football, there are dozens of men on the field. These men are big, muscular, fast, and all very powerful. And with all these giants, well, most of them, Battling across the field, there's a little ref on the field. But this ref can stop play, move the ball, give the ball to either team, and remove anybody off the field if necessary. Because while all these men have great power, the ref is the one who has great power and also the authority. God is giving you power to tackle anything. But always remember it is by his power and his authority that we are given these powers. And when you abuse these powers, there are consequences. And in Romans 13 and 1, I leave by saying this. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Say that one more time. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Saying let us all recognize the higher power that's above us. Because there is no power but of God. And all the powers that be, all the powers that we possess, are given to us by God. God bless you, and I hope somebody got something. Amen. Where is your faith? I got a new term, too. Spoiled believers. <laughs> Go hear that again, St. John. <laughs> Spoiled believers. Take a seat, brother.